try to keep it brief, and it, uh, thanks to the few of you that have stuck around for this presentation. Uh, as Doug said, my name is Bill Parmentier. I'm a head of development for the company that's called Ductor up there in the corner, and uh, what we do is poultry manure, uh, anaerobic digestion with 100% poultry manure. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. So first, a little bit of background on our company. It's actually a Finnish company uh, that was founded in 2009, and our CEO kind of looked at the world. He had been successful in business and said, what are some of the challenges that we're going to be facing for the next generation? And clearly, it was a search for sustainable food and energy production. I think that's been a theme in a lot of the speeches that I've heard here at this conference. Uh, and he was specifically interested in nitrogen production for fertilizer and how could we potentially do it better than the way we've been doing it for the last 100 years, trying to suck it out of the atmosphere in, in a very energy resource intensive manner. So he quickly hit on uh, the, the nitrogen that would be locked up inside of what is to many people considered waste, uh, some sort of manure, and specifically in poultry manures. Now the problem, as uh, Adamola has mentioned uh, when he talked about some of the conditions for anaerobic digestion, some of the previous speakers, is that um, that uh, the methanogens like a very specific sort of home, right? They're very cozy and they don't like to get outside their frequent ranges, including uh, the one that he had talked about, the, the level of ammonia in in the uh, digesters. And when that level gets to about 1,500 milligrams per liter, then you start to see some of the inhibition, the ammonia inhibition. And uh, as it gets even higher to 3,000 uh, or above, it will kill off your digester and kill off those methanogens. So clearly, if you're going to spend a lot of money on uh, creating a digester for, you don't want to have a sick digester or kill it off with your ammonia. And um, because of the higher nitrogen content in that poultry litter, in the turkey litter, it was something that uh, he wanted to take a look at and see if he could solve that or do something about it. So uh, what did we do? Well, he quickly figured out that um, the methanogens aren't the only bugs in the game, and through so, sort of a natural selection of, uh, well, actually, a, a process that took almost eight or so years in the lab, uh, they started reviewing different sort of uh, microbes and found some that were much comfortable in a higher nitrogen uh, area, in the nitrogen levels up to even like 5,000 milligrams per liter. And they'll actually produce or digest some of that nitrogen out of the poultry litter. They're not producing biogas at this point. These are not methanogens. These are just uh, these microbes that are going to take out the nitrogen for us that then we can allow uh, to take what, what is left, the solid digestate, put it into a digester, and we'll have a more stable and efficient biogas production. So uh, after this selection and, and after a lot of the research and the time in the lab on a bench scale, we decided to, uh, we partnered with a, a farm, a dairy digester that was up in Tuorla, Finland. We did a 2,000 hour trial in which uh, we put our front end system, and I'm going to show you shortly here what sort of a sample system looks and we can talk through it and you'll be able to see it. But we put our system on the front end of it and then through that uh, fermenter is what we call it, we ran 100% poultry litter and uh, and then ultimately put it in through uh, the digester and we had no problems throughout our 2000 hour trial. I've got another uh, slide that'll show you some of the data that comes from that. So as I said, 100% poultry litter is a feedstock. <clears throat> So here's more or less a, a sample of what we do. We come in here, and this is where you enter with your, your poultry litter. This light color here at A is our fermenter, and that's that primary step. Pretty much E back here, these are just anaerobic digesters, the same as you'd see as a uh, dairy digester, as a swine digester. Uh, in fact, uh, when he started thinking about this in terms of Europe, uh, I think one of the earlier speakers uh, was even, uh, might have been Carlton, you were talking about some of the numbers of digesters in Europe versus the number of digesters, the pitifully small number of digesters here in America. But uh, in Europe, he was more thinking of, of an add-on to some of these digesters. It's a well-established community, but if you have a facility and now you can deal with the sort of high nitrogen feedstock. Uh, so you will have an analysis of the feedstock that comes in. If it's uh, very high nitrogen, then you put it in here. If it's not, you just bypass it and send it right to a digester. So it was a sort of a selective thing. Uh, but so this is our primary, I would say, the innovation of what uh, our team has come up with is this first step. So these are the, uh, uh, the 
the ammonia pretreatment, if you will, and uh, we separate that out uh, in this section right here. So solid liquid separations. The solids will go into the digester, and the liquids, which are carrying a lot of the ammonia there, will be separated out. Uh, we do a little pH adjustment, uh, just with some basic wood ash, and that's to increase the volatilization to allow for better ammonia capture here, and this is just a simple column ammonia air stripper. Uh, once we heat the ammonia and then precipitate it back out, we capture the ammonia. And uh, if you look on our website, on my paper, there's a link to a video. Originally, they were thinking ammonium sulfate as a potential um, off product. And, um, but what we're looking at here for the United States is what we prefer and what we found a partner is just plain ammonia water or um, just uh, ammonia in solution. It comes out to be about a 500 fertilizer product. We capture that and we put it in storage here. What water is not, uh, what the ammonia that isn't anything that's not captured, the water just cycles back into the primary fermenter and it'll come through the system, much like a, a distiller will take the head and the tail of the whiskey that doesn't, that has maybe too much of the uh, contaminants and they'll send it back into, into the process for the future. So uh, again, this is about a five day process in here. Uh, and then after the five days, the digestate or the fermentate, I should say, will go into the digester, spending 21 days or so in the digester. Uh, we've been focusing mostly on poultry litter here in the United States because uh, just for the simple fact, I guess it's called, I would consider it low hanging fruit. It's, there's a lot of it out there. We don't really have a great solution for it. And um, so that's where our, as we're bringing this technology to market over the last year, we've been focusing on trying to find these projects where we can, uh, areas where there's a lot of animal production, but maybe not a lot of cash crop production. So um, knowing that simple field spreading is not always an option, there might be surplus in those markets. And that's what we look to exploit and come in as potential um, manure management solution. And uh, do you have a question now or do you want to just wait to the end? Or? No. Go ahead. In part A. So I have to get back to you. It's, I think uh, we do fill these with water. It's going to be moving through the system. It's not a dry system at all. It's it's a typical. It's not 1%, but I think if I was just looking, it might be on the order of maybe 10 or 20 or so. Uh, I'm sorry, not moisture content, but solids content. So mostly water here. It's not dry. So here's kind of the, the meat of the presentation, and uh, this is a bit of a busy graph, but um, if I'll just walk you through it, this is our trial right here, so days of operation on the side. And this is the ammonium nitrogen and uh, the level of it in the uh, digester. This is in the digester, so this is following our pretreatment and what it looks like going into the digester. And it's normalized right here for our production of gas, of biomethane. So 100% is our daily production. We normalize it that way. Green is the ductor process. Purple is the conventional process. <clears throat> so as you can see with the dash line down here, this is sort of the ammonium concentration, the nitrogen concentration of that product that's being put into the digester. And it's pretty low in its level right there at about uh, 700 consistently, which is well below any sort of inhibition threshold. As you can see in the conventional reactor, um, it starts out at about a thousand and then it climbs up through 1500, which I think is relevant to look at here. And then ultimately plateauing up here somewhere about 3200. So when we look at gas production, as I said, this is normalized for R. So we're hundred percent initially in a conventional reactor. If you just put in straight, uh, poultry litter, you might get a little bit higher. You have about maybe 10 to 15, 20% uh, better production of biomethane of gas. Uh, but then again, now you see, just like the literature would tell us, that that 1,500 milligrams per liter point, you see that grass drop off in production. Till the point where, towards the end of the test, we didn't actually allow the digester to die off completely, but we're already looking at under 60% of the production that we're getting with the stable gas production. So I thought that was pretty significant, and it pretty much proves exactly what the literature says that the bugs will do or not do when you get them in an unfavorable condition. So again, what did we learn? Well, from this process, we do have sort of multiple possible revenue streams, and that's the title of my presentation, so I figured I'd address them here. We talk about biogas production. It's now stable. 
uh, as far as uh, uh, substrates go, when you look at uh, dairy manure, swine manure, and poultry manure, you're going to get much higher biogas production from a poultry litter, let's say. Uh, and so you have an improved uh, amount of methane that you can produce per ton of, of manure or litter. Uh, we have chosen in working with a partner in uh, the fertilizer industry to pull out that nitrogen. So by solving the problem of the ammonia inhibition in the digestion process, we pull off that nitrogen and we are creating this, uh, again, just ammonia water, 5 and O concentration for a fertilizer that's available as a liquid fertilizer. It can be applied. It's in a plant available form. Uh, you put it on a field, you could drip it on, you can spray it on, you put it on a pivot, anything, any sort of way that you can do the liquid fertilizer. Out of the end, your, the back end, the, the digestate, we can dry that. It'll come out. It'll be sort of a moist soil, just a typical, uh, digestate that'll come out of any other digester. Uh, it'll have a little bit of higher phosphorus, potassium. We don't actually get all the nitrogen out of the process. And in fact, we only, in that first step, we take about five to six uh, I'm sorry, 50 to 60, 65 percent of the nitrogen out. So there's some that remains here, and what we're looking at is a potential possibility for a formulation of about a 464 fertilizer that um, we can also put on, uh, with, if we can heat, uh, put a heater on the end and dry or a dryer, we might be able to pelletize that, any of the water that we remove from that, uh, that sort of moist digestate, we'd be able to recycle right back into the process. Process is thermophilic, so it's pathogen-free. Uh, I talk about these other possible cost savings, and I will say this is revenue in the form of a cost savings. It's, you know, avoided cost. We're working with uh, one group uh, and their laying operation. As you know, they'll have uh, a lot of wash water, process water for the eggs. It ends up in a lagoon, and they have to store that and deal with it. There might be wastewater. Depending on the area, there might be wastewater treatment or water treatment requirements for that. Uh, because we can just take all that, and they pretty much don't have to discharge it in a lagoon. It'll just go right into our digesters, and we'll use that as our water. Um, we're able to recycle that through. Um, when you think of manure or piles or windrows, you might think there might be flies, there might be pest management that you have to deal with. Again, because we're taking in um, products, you know, at least we have a five-day cycle time for that initial uh, fermenter. So... Uh, we're reducing the amount of time that the manure is just piled outside in the litter shed waiting for the spring or fall spreading season. So there's savings there. Um, someone earlier today talked about some of those environmental attributes or those savings. There, there's a lot of consumer pressure for many of these organizations to have uh, greener, more sustainable processes. And so we're often able to, to provide some sort of, you know, maybe for their downstream producer, if they're producing eggs for another, uh, you know, production source, if they can prove that they have a greener process, they might be able to charge a premium because their downstream partners can do that. So those are just a few of some of those other things that, again, are avoided costs, uh, which come in the form of revenue. And then, as I said, while we've been focusing, and I've talked about today mostly about poultry and poultry litter and maybe even uh, laying hen manure, any night high nitrogen feedstock is possible here. Anything that would otherwise cause that ammonia inhibition, anything with a lot of protein. So fish waste is something that they're, uh, again, I told you we're from Finland. It's, uh, it's up in the Nordics, right? There's a lot of fish production up there. So this is something they're looking heavily up there. Uh, again, regional kind of thing. Meat production, slaughterhouse. People, we've had some initial discussions with slaughterhouse wastes. You're talking blood and the, the remnants. Anything that's left from that process. We could put it in a digester and, and let it sort of do its work and produce biogas and produce some fertilizer. From it. So what's next? The, I told you that we had this set up in Tuorla, Finland. Uh, it was just, it was never intended to be permanent. It was always just sort of a way that we could prove our concept on this farm. And um, so what we decided to do is we wanted to set up a little bit more of a permanent presence, and we wanted to bring that over here to North America. So we looked around, and we ended up finding a partner in Mexico that's partnering with us, and we are bringing that plant. In Finland, we are using it as uh, more of electricity generation. It was about a 50-kilowatt plant, so just a real small size, not the size that we do it here uh, in the U.S. And in the U.S., uh, it's not probably going to be producing electricity or energy. We're looking to produce gas because we'll put the gas in the pipeline, and a green gas will have far more uh, 
price potential and benefit to us as green gas than it would be as just electricity. But you can, because it's just like any other digester, you could hook it up to some sort of CHP. And um, some of our Latin American partners are more interested in st stable electricity, especially some of the poultry growers down there, that it's a little bit warmer. And if they can't keep their barns at a constant temperature because the grid is constantly knocking them out, then they have to flip on their uh, diesel generator, which is going to cost them money. So again, we could be saving some of that money there. So we've moved the plant there. In fact, I just talked with my uh, team yesterday, and we're sending them down there. The most of the heavy equipment arrived from fin <coughs> excuse me from Finland uh, this week, and they're going down there next week to install it. It's already under construction. I think we'll probably be charging up the digester and seeding it in the early part or later part of May, but not be fully operational and completed until summer of 2019. It's not designed to be a full up energy producing plant. It's really a proof of concept for our partner to start a future investment for other digesters uh, to work with them. But we're going to use it. We're going to take the opportunity because now there's a couple of things that uh, it will show us and that more research for ourselves. Uh, first and foremost is uh, it's in a drier area of Mexico, so having a lot of that fresh water need is is something that plagues them. It's a, it's a big expense for them, and because our process is actually very efficient, it doesn't. We have a, a little makeup water because we lose some through the product, etc., with the ammonia water that we make. But um, but overall, and I can't tell you the exact percentage, and that's part of what we'll be looking to kind of nail down is how much can we conserve the water and feed it right back into the system and prove this water efficiency? And if it's to the point where what we do know is they're not going to have to be dumping a lot of fresh water continually into washing their eggs. And so that's one of the things that we're looking to do there, as well as um, I think one of the previous speakers talked about it, but um, you know we have a different method in North America of production for poultry than, say, Europe. The feed is different. The content of the feed is a lot higher energy. So we might expect to have higher nutrients and perhaps uh, we'll have more of the offtake of the various uh, products than we would from the European literature values that we're looking at. So that's, um, that's the most immediate thing. And then we have a facility that is in Anson County, North Carolina, uh, which is just sort of the east of Charlotte. And um, if any of you are in the biogas news or seeing some of this, uh, Northern Carolina, or North Carolina has a, a pilot program for allowing biogas into their natural gas pipelines. Uh, they started it last year, and since then, there have been uh, three groups who have al been allowed to put biogas, who passed through their, their hoops and allowed to put biogas into the pipeline. We were the third one to be selected earlier in January. So, um, and there was a, one of the speakers had a picture of a pork biogas plant in North Carolina, if you saw it. One of the guy on the right was one of our partners who's been helping us. This guy named Gus Simmons who spoke at this conference two years ago. Some of you might know him. Um, anyhow, um, our first US, U.S. facility will be there, and we're hoping to turn, not hoping, we will be turning dirt or starting that starting May 1st. So in a week or two, we'll be doing uh, the early kind of groundwork and sort of civil works for preparing the way for the digesters to come later in the year and ultimately look to start more or less putting gas in the pipeline and, and have regular operations by the very beginning of 2020. So that's it for us. We're actively looking for places where uh, I've to, I love to come and talk with extension agents because, you know, they they have a handle on where there's that surplus. They're out there talking to the growers. We think we have something to offer, especially now. Um, you know, Minnesota, there's talk in one of the earlier panels, too, about uh, water quality, leachates, and over-application of manures or over-application of fertilizers in general. And we hope that in places where there's a lot of production, we are an alternate solution to that. Maybe if the farmer's left with this stuff piling up and he has nowhere to get rid of it. Um, uh, John, you were saying it's worth about zero to ten, right, is what you said, where you are in some places? The brokers get zero to ten dollars per ton of the of the manure, and so it's so it can be hard to get rid of it. We went on a tour in Sustain, and uh, the head of the president there was saying he was talking about at one point he couldn't give it away to his neighbors. He was trying to just say, "Here, you can have it. You can put it on your fields," and the cash crop farmers wouldn't take it. So we're hoping to deal with that, but of course, um, that's just that's more or less 
what we have, uh, what we're talking about, and what we're looking forward to bringing to market here in this next year. With that, I'm pretty much done. If there's any questions for any of you that have some, go ahead. How's your process respond to the variable moving? Yeah, you know, I mean, we are ideally we have multiple farms, and this is sort of who was it? I think it was it um, um, when Nick was talking about the sort of the type of the three types of digesters or what they see as coming forward. And so we don't just this is not a, you don't put this on your farm. This is something that we're putting centrally. We're taking the uh, Anson County project is going to take about 45,000 tons of litter annually. So it's from multiple barns that have different clean out schedules. So it, it is a bit of a variable loading rate, but we're constantly they're constantly caking between the more or less 250 houses. It shouldn't be much to manage. I mean, that's I guess that would be you can't discount it as completely zero, but it's not like it's it's binary either. You know, we'll have a lot of different litter on different times, whether that be cakes or full cleanups. And the one thing that going to that that I talked with one of our our hauler partners is interesting. Most people clean out their barns now in the spring and the fall because that's when you can apply it, and they won't clean it out in the summer. So if you talk or if you know any of these haulers or these cleanup guys, they're going like mad right about now, and they're just kind of finishing up, but. It's really difficult for them because they're going all day long because they gotta clean the barn, go spread it on the field, and then the next day, and there's a lot of these people. Well, really, that's driven, I think, by the fact that they don't have anything else to do with it. Where do you put all that litter? It's better if it's fresher, so let's clean it out and then let's put it on the field. But now with something like this, now that could change, and if with the work of their integrators, they might be able to say, hey, why don't we, why don't you wait a block, another cycle, and then we'll clean out your barn in the summer. So now the labor costs might be less because you can deal with, you don't have to have that mad rush of, I only have so many people to clean out and it sort of can normalize that. And the same thing you can do in the winter. You don't have to worry about spreading in the winter. You can just, we bring it to our digester and we'll probably have trucks coming two or three trucks a day into the digester. So I don't know if that's a long way of saying, I don't know, but I don't think it's going to be an issue because we have a lot of, a lot of different variability in the availability of the FTP side to be able to put some in. We are also planning to have more or less an enclosed receiving hall. So as I said, you know, it's a five days in that first cycle. We'll be able to keep some there and then put it in. Go ahead, sir. So you want to know? So it's just a, a standard um, column. Uh, stripper or air stripper. So we, like I said, we kind of have we volatilize that ammonia, precipitates down in the droplet form, and then hot air coming from underneath comes out into a gas. Now you have gaseous ammonia that goes through. Again, I'll say this by the way, I'm not an environment, environmental engineer, so uh, if I get this partly wrong, this is the way I understand it. So now the ammonia is in the gas, and then the second chamber drop it back. So here you've got. Um, that ammonia, the water, the, the sort of the dirty water that's coming through here will be dropped, will be dropped down here in this sort of column. You'll have from the bottom the hot air coming up. It'll for, force that droplet and some of that to volatilize into gas. That gas then captured and goes down here. And now from the top we have cold water and the gas coming up and it'll be condensed. Again, sort of like whiskey distillery. You know, I, I think of this in terms of what I know, which is whiskey distillery, but uh, it's really, it's, I found it to be a very similar process. So we condense it down here, and then that's how we capture it. So I don't know if that's, I can get you a better answer if you want to contact me afterwards, and I can connect you with our engineers. But from the way I talked with them, they said this is pretty much just a standard column air stripper. Exactly, without any acid. The wood H gets it to the pH, the, you know, the wood ash sort of gets it a little bit more basic, which allows for more volatilization. Um, it's not even required, it's just, it's just I think, it allows for more of that ammonia to come out there. That's one thing we looked at, and why I said uh, originally, if you look at one of the videos, it talks about ammonia sulfate we were talking about. In fact, maybe some other things, you might see different tanks here, putting some sort of fly tank like you know, sulfuric acid, put it in there and force it into these little things you can we decided to go against that because we think, um, and ammonia water is already an approved organic product, an organic fertilizer, uh, in a 5-0-0 concentration. Uh, 
And so when you look at our process, it's really just poultry manuring here, water here, a little wood ash, and that's it. So, and then nature's bugs. So we think that's about as organic as they come. So coming out here to have an organic fertilizer, they're doing it. Any more questions? Any more? It's just about five o'clock. Just in time. I, uh, I will be leaving this afternoon, uh, shortly after this, but I'll leave a couple flyers out there as my contact information on that. Otherwise, it's on the paper, and feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Sir. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for staying on time.